I guess I'll bend over. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be with a group of uh, horse people in Florida in the wintertime. Uh, what I thought I'd try to do today is explain a little bit about veterinary anesthesiology. I would guess most of you probably didn't know veterinary anesthesiologists exist, but they do. Uh, and I, I thought I'd spend just a minute, because I'm a horse person too, and, and most of you have never heard of me, which is just wonderful. Uh, because the only time you care about the anesthesiologist is if something goes wrong. And thankfully, things don't go wrong all that often. So who am I? This is me in 1954 when I was two with my grandfather and my sister. My grandfather was a farmer in uh, central Ohio, moved from Pleasantville to Centerburg in the 30s, had two draft horses, no tractor, two draft horses, one good eye between the two draft horses. <laughs> and when he moved from Pleasantville to Centerburg, 30 miles, he drove the horses those 30 miles over a series of days and slept in barns as he was moving. So I uh, have a long history in the horse business. This is my father on the right. He bought his first standard bread when I was three. That's night call. He was a physician anesthesiologist, so that's kind of probably why I ended up doing what I did in some way to give me something to talk to my father about uh, with horses. This is my father's first winter. Now, if you, the date on the other one was about 58, this is 68. So he owned standard reds for 10 years before he had a winner. Uh, and that was a foal of the horse that you saw previously. So I was a horse guy. I rode a little saddle breads, groomed standard breads, went to vet school uh, because I thought I wanted to be outdoors and work with uh, medicine. And then I married right, as you can tell from this picture. I've been married, uh, we're in our 41st year. And we've had three months where we haven't owned a horse. So I married a horsewoman, which the men in the room will understand the implications of that. And we had two children. Uh, this is our daughter, so we did the 4-H thing, as you do in Ohio, uh, with her quarter horse, Brandy. And then you have to get your hair done. So that was a picture of the Mrs. and Megan. And then I have a son, but that seemed to have skipped a generation, because here's my grandchildren, 14 months old, uh, riding a rocking horse around Christmas time. But th what really changed for me in a lot of ways is that I had paid for horses. I had taken care of my father's horses. I'd never had my own horse. Uh, just, they were my wife's, they were my kids, but until they're yours, it's a whole different feeling. And so when I got my kids through college and got them established, and so I had a little more money than I had uh, previously. Uh, I took up combined driving. So this is Geller Duder Gus. He's a Dutch harness horse. I bought him when he was three and he's now seven. So this is the avocation, I guess, of uh, my extension of being a veterinarian. So I, I thought I'd introduce myself in that manner. So now we'll talk about anesthesia. A Couple things to think about, one, Really, the drugs that we use are very similar to the drugs that are used in human medicine. We use sedatives, we use muscle relaxants, we use injectable drugs to induce anesthesia, we use inhalant anesthetics to maintain anesthesia, and we use ventilators to control ventilation uh, as the horse is anesthetized. No single drug, combinations of drugs in order to get done. The estimated risk of significant anesthetic complications is a lot higher in the horse than the species that we deal with. In people, it's about one in 100,000 anesthetics have a significant complication. In dogs, it's about one in 2,000. In cats, it's about one in 1,000. In horse, there are a number of scientific reports about this, and the estimated risk ranges from one in 63 normal horses anesthetized to about one in a thousand anesthetics. So is it perhaps more perilous than it is in people? Certainly, it's kind of similar to what it is in cats. And cats and horses are 
particular challenges for anesthesiologists. So why is that? Well, if you think about it, I, I've been anesthetized in the last two years, perhaps you, someone, we want to ask for a show of hands, but I would, I would guess that most of us uh, have a loved one who's been anesthetized or has been anesthetized ourselves. So, you know, they tell you about a month ahead you're going to need anesthesia. In most instances, you're lying in a bed. Sometimes somebody's holding your hand telling you things are all right. They give you a blanket to keep you warm. They're, they ask you at least five times if you have any drug allergies and when was the last time you ate. They, they keep asking you that and they have several people ask you that. They're, they tell you what's going to happen to you. You're going to, you know, they used to be you used to count backwards from 100. Now they just kind of say you're going to kind of go asleep and we're going to move you around. Uh, they ask you if you have any questions about what they just told you on several occasions. They, you drift off to sleep. You wake up when the surgery is over. They give the ice cubes to suck on for a while until they think they can excuse you from their hospital. They put you in your car via wheelchair. They don't let you walk out of the hospital. Then you go home and you watch movies for however long it takes you. Now let's contrast to that to what we see with horses. You can't tell them what's going to happen. I mean, we talk to our horses, but we can't really make, they can't make any sense of this. You van them to a surgical facility, typically. They walk into a padded room. We'll show you a video of that in a little bit. We give them a sedative to calm them. They lower their heads, they get relaxed. We give them drugs intravenously to cause them to fall asleep and slump to the ground. So it was as if uh, someone was anesthetizing me, gave me drugs as I'm standing here, and I hit the ground, and then they figure out what they're going to do with me next. Okay. We hoist them by their feet. We place them on a surgical table. We do the surgery. We take them back, hoist them by their feet, put them back in the recovery stall. They wake up, rise to their feet, usually within 60 minutes. Most horses aren't recumbent all that much, so they're, once they're awake, they want to stand up. We need to be able to control that. They walk back to their stall, typically we get fed somewhere around the two hour period, sometimes a little longer depending on the disease, and then they're vanned back to their home stable. So is it reasonable to assume that this is more stressful for horses than it would be for people? And I think we'd probably all agree that's true. Scientific studies have shown this to be the case. So horses get increased cortisol levels and increased catecholamine levels anytime you anesthetize them. Whether you do surgery, whether you don't do surgery. If you anesthetize them, let them wake up, they're stressed. And I think you have a little better appreciation now of why that might be. So how do we deal with that? And why, why does this occur? Well, this is a side shot of a horse. It's a uh, it's a drawing, obviously, and the yellow line represents the horse's diaphragm. Horse has a very long, sloping diaphragm. Horses are not made to lie down very much. They're certainly not made to lie on their back. And what happens is with that long, sloping diaphragm is when the horse is on its back, those intestines that Dr. Bross showed you are laying on the lungs and laying on the great vessels of the thorax. And so respiratory function is compromised, cardiovascular function is compromised. We need to compensate for that with our anesthetic technique. So horses, I mean, you don't see many horses out in the field on their back for any length of time. Certainly, my horses like to roll. I'm sure yours do as well. But they don't actually sit there that long. So as I said, the cardiovascular and respiratory systems are compromised when the horses are anesthetized. We compensate for that with intravenous fluids. We use agents that increase the force of contraction of the heart. Dibutamine would be the one that's most frequently used to increase blood pressure so that we are supporting perfusion of all the structures in the body. We're particularly worried about the downside of a horse in lateral recumbency or the hip muscles of a horse and dorsal recumbency are on their back. We also need to monitor respiratory function. We do that through taking arterial blood samples and running what's called blood gases, which tells us how normal their ventilation is, how normal their oxygenation is. And so we monitor those things and make adjustments as best we can to keep them in as much a normal range as they can be in. And the other thing we do is do everything we can to minimize 
the duration of anesthesia. There isn't a hard and fast rule, but if you're there more than three hours, the incidence of complication goes up pretty dramatically. If you think about it another way, average horse weighs 1,000 pounds, maybe 1,200. So we're talking about average thoroughbred and perhaps a small warm blood. Maintenance of arterial blood pressures is very important to perfuse those tissues that we talked about on the downside of a horse in lateral recumbency to also perfuse the kidneys, perfuse the bowel, perfuse all those structures. And so monitoring of arterial blood pressure is the most important thing that we can do as we anesthetize horses. When you go to the doctor, you get a cuff on your arm and they tell you what your blood pressure is. That isn't accurate in horses. They've tried a whole bunch of machines. None of them work well enough to be able to quantify the blood pressure of an anesthetized horse. So it requires an arterial catheter replaced. And typically, we use an oscilloscope type thing. It's, a, it's the same thing that's used in human medicine when an arterial line or an art line is placed. And so we can monitor blood pressure very accurately. And we do things to raise the blood pressure as needed. And it gives us an idea of how well the horse is doing. Positioning and padding is very important. This is a picture of a horse in lateral recumbency. That's about a foot thick foam rubber pad. We also pad the up leg off of the down leg because just the pressure of the up leg on the down leg can change the blood flow of the down leg in a horse under anesthesia. So these are just things that when we drill them, they become, oh yes, this is what you do, this is what you do, this is what you do. Other things to think about is we all know horses are, for the most part, flight animals. Their, their reaction in many instances is to leave, uh, take off. When they awaken from anesthesia, sometimes they try to leave too quickly. Sometimes they get a little excited. Sometimes they try to rise before the other drugs are gone, before the inhalants have been expired, before the induction drugs are completely gone. And so they try to stand up before they're ready. And if you think about it, we said, let's take 1,000 for a round figure. When a horse stands, it's raising 1,000 pounds two to three feet up in the air. Now, none of us can do that, I don't think. Maybe as a group, we could. Maybe if we had four legs, we could. But that's what horses do. And you look at your horses get up in the field after they've laid down. It's an effort for them, particularly your old horses. I mean, they just, you just say, oh, come on, get up. Well. Think about that, then you've had a horse that's had a surgical procedure in the last hour, a horse that's sedated. That horse also has to get up. And you can't really lift them. You can help them, but you can't lift them. So we sedate horses in recovery to slow the period of, to lengthen their period of recovery so we get rid of all the other drugs before they then try up, try to get up. And then we assist them to stand. We use a head and tail rope not because we're lifting the horse, but really what you're doing, if you think about, if you watch horses get up, most of them roll the sternal, raise their head, place their front feet, push up from behind. So what the tail rope does is just slow their forward momentum so they don't run into the wall in front of them. It gives them some support. The head rope then, once they're up, we pull their head rope to the wall so they'll stand there and not try to do too much. So those are the risks for any horse. There are some horses with added risk, the very old and the very young. Very young foals under three or four months of age or aren't as mature in terms of their cardiovascular, liver, and respiratory system and, and renal system as well. So they're harder for us. And they're very old. And, and you know, when I was in vet school, 18 was an old horse. 18 isn't an old horse anymore. And I think the issue with age is more fitness than it is the actual number. I think a fit horse is always a better anesthetic candidate for me. Very big horses have increased risks. They're harder to help. They have more pressure on the downside related to their weight pushing down on the legs. Emergencies and other surgeries are more difficult. If there's an additional stress associated with what we're doing, long procedures, again, three hours is a rule of thumb. You don't want to be much longer than that. You'd like to be as short as you can be. And then if you're repairing fractures, 
just the stress associated with that, and frequently the length of time becomes it a, a longer problem. I said that the estimated risk runs from 1 in 63 to 1 in 1,000 anesthetics according to reports in scientific publication. Rudin Riddle is the 1 in 1,000. It's, it's the only private practice that I know of that took a look at their anesthetic recovery mortality rates and published a scientific paper about it. So I can't tell you what any other practice does. And this is before I was at Rudin Riddle, so I feel good about coming to a place that has taken anesthesia as seriously it has, as it has uh, for its entire uh, time. As I said, anesthesia has been a priority at Rudin Riddle uh, since it opened. Each person responsible for anesthesia goes through relatively extensive training. We bring the interns in to Lexington. We bring the technicians into Lexington. We give them a two-week course. It's sometimes in Lexington, we're anesthetizing 30 horses. And so we get a lot of repetition and train the technicians and train the interns. And frankly, there's, we, we're very formulaic about how we do it. But it works for us. And so we're going to keep being formulaic about what we do it. And the beauty of it is for someone who's teaching and who oversees the anesthesia is that if they call me with a problem, I know what the horse has had, I know what they've tried to do to fix what the horse had, and now, okay, let's go a step beyond and do this. So as someone who is in a lot of ways responsible for what's going on, it's great to know that we've followed our protocols and this is what we've done. We have very fast surgeons, which is useful, and we always assist our anesthetic recovery. So that's just, frankly, the root and riddle post posture towards anesthesia. Here's a video that we did. Yeah. Let me talk over to be a little. I thought I had the sound down, but then it came up. So, this is a video that's on our website if you'd like to look at it. Horses, this is our facility in Lexington. We bring the horse in. One of the important things we do is wash their mouth out because we're placing an endotracheal tube into the trachea through the mouth. And so we need to make sure that we don't push any feedstuffs down into the trachea or the lungs as you might. We sedate the horse. Every horse gets a catheter placed in our hospital. We sedate the horse. We induce anesthesia against the wall. So the horse has been given the induction drugs at this point. We push it against the wall. It slides down the wall. Nice. That's a nice induction. Roll the horse out into lateral recumbency. We place an endotracheal tube using a piece of PVC pipe as a bite block. We place that into the trachea. We hoist the horse and place it on the padded table that I talked about. We then, we're hooking them up to the anesthesia machine. You can see our monitoring equipment. We're placing an electrocardiogram an arterial catheter is placed. We put eye lube in all our horses. So we're a little farther along. We're prepping the leg. Now, this isn't a surgery talk. This is an anesthesia talk. So we're going to do a surgical prep. We're going to roll it then into our surgical room up in Lexington. I said we had fast surgeons. <laughs> we're now going to the recovery stall. And that's the horse getting up. And Steve Martin used to say comedy is not pretty. I would tell you that recovery is never particularly pretty, particularly if you're not used to it. So that was a really nice recovery, frankly. We like him to get up and stand there planted and stand perfectly, but that would not in any sense be atypical. That's what we expect to happen. And with that, we want to take a question or we want to, yes. 
Yes. Is that there are three. There are three hospitals that I know of that have water recoveries. One's at Penn, uh, one's at Alamo and Pintado in California, and one's at Washington State University. They're used occasionally, particularly with fracture patients, but they're not used routinely. Uh, we haven't felt the need to have one, and uh, we 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 have people who just do recovery. We have six people. Uh, they, some of them have been with us for 18 years, and they're good at it. And we, number one rule is don't rush recovery. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's really the number one rule. And, and so the problem with water recoveries is, one, you gotta get them out of the water once they've recovered, which can be a problem. Sometimes you have to sort of re-anesthetize them to do that, and they're very labor intensive, and they take a very long time, and so, they're not particularly practical, but when you have a horse with a fracture, that particularly one that is somewhat unstable, uh, they have real benefit. I think we better go on, had we? I'll be in the back later. If anybody has a question, I'd be happy to visit with you.